Welcome back. For those of you uh, new here, this is a weekly installment of the Ethics, Law, and Society Forum here at Sonoma State. Before we get to our speaker, I just want to make one quick announcement. Um, if you're a pre-law student, uh, there's a new mock trial team being started here. And if you're interested, there's going to be an informational meeting this Thursday at noon. Thursday at noon in Stevenson 2001. So if you're into uh, be law or just into, you know, trials and arguments and stuff like that, um, check out the mock, new mock trial team. Um, also, one other announcement, if you uh, want to learn more about studying ethics and free law, remember there's some literature up here um, that you can come grab. And lastly, our speaker today um, has some literature about his work, if you're interested in more. And I'll be passing around that handout that he's got. I'm not quite sure if there are enough copies to go around, so maybe look on with somebody sitting next to you. Okay, with that out of the way, let me go ahead and introduce this week's speaker. Um, we're very privileged to have a, um, well, let me give you the background first. So, uh, Brock Dolman is the co-founder of the Southern Circle LLC Intentional Community and the Occidental Arts and Ecology Center, uh, where he co-directs the Permaculture Program and the Water Institute. Um, he is by trade a professional wildlife biologist and uh, restoration ecologist, and he works in particular on permaculture and watershed. And we're uh, very privileged to have him. He speaks around the world. He's spoken in China and Cuba and Costa Rica and Zimbabwe and other points far and near. And um, so we're very lucky to have a renowned expert here in our own backyard. Um, so he will be speaking today on watershed, uh, climate change, water, human development, restoration, which of course are maybe, well, among the most important topics of the day. So uh, please join me in welcoming Brock Goldman. Uh, thanks, Josh. Hi, everybody. How y'all doing? All right. Well, I'll just cut to the chase and get into this. Josh gave me a little bit of a sense of this class. It sounds like you guys are covering an enormous amount of content all over a wide array of subjects. So I'm generally going to be in the world of water, but you'll see when we get to talk about water, we get to talk about everything. So um, as Josh said, I do live at this Occidental Arts and Ecology Center. And if anybody wants a little, some a flyer about that, there's stuff down here after the, the talk. And, and there is a little handout going around. I don't know if there's enough for folks about this talk. But check us out if you want it, oac.org. We're an 80 acre piece of property out in West Sonoma County, above the little town of Occidental. And it's a retreat center, residential, organic farm, demonstration, permaculture center that 10 of us co own for the last 20 years. So it's an intentional community. It's basically a glorified hippie commune. We just have shorter hair and better lawyers than they did 30 years ago. And then one of the programs I run is this Water Institute, which you can see is an acronym. I'm interested in watersheds. How do we advocate, train, educate, do research and restoration, if you will, on behalf of water? Um, Josh did say that I am a biologist, and I'm a biologist since three years old. While my dad was in Vietnam, I was chasing tadpoles and rice paddies in Japan, and, and just spent my life as growing up interested in fishing and hunting and life and critters and snakes and things, and then just figured out how to make a living doing that. So technically, I've mostly been an endangered species vertebrate biologist. I study animals that have backbones, right? Fish and mammals and reptiles and amphibians and, and birds. And, and those, those that are considered endangered or listed species by, in this case, California. And, and such. And I think what I found in doing that work in the, for environmental impact reports is that when the water cycle of a place has been compromised because of human land use, the carrying capacity for life in that place is accordingly typically compromised. And so as a, as a biologist, which by definition is one who studies life, I got, I try, I'm really interested in just, wow, let's trip out on life a second. And the first reckoning in that reality is that this planet here that we live on with this moon that's full, I don't know if anybody's been checking the full moon, it's happened last night. Um, it's, it's called planet Earth, but it's not planet Earth, it's planet water. You live on planet water, you don't live on planet Earth. Seventy percent of the surface of this planet is actually covered in water, right? And then if you were to take the total volume, if like this little bottle of water here was actually the volume of water on the planet, 97 percent of this bottle 
would be ocean water and only 2% of it would be like the, the stuff that's on the mountain tops and the caps and the poles, the Antarctic and Antarctic uh, poles. And then only less than 1% of the total volume of water on planet water is actually fresh water that we could use to drink. So it's a pretty precious substance. Um, the interesting thing about living on planet water is it's the only known place in the universe, as far as we can tell, lots of folks are trying to figure this out somewhere else, where life is endemic. Who knows what endemic means? Kind of a big word during college, so we get to use big words here, right? Endemic. It means that it occurs nowhere else. And typically we think about plants that are endemic live on a little rocky hillside with special geology. But life is endemic to planet water, and it's no coincidence that that's the case. So as far as we can tell out there, we've got life because of water, <coughs> this primordial soup that life emerged out of. The interesting thing is, and I'll come back to this in a bit of why it's important to grok this, is that water, imagine a molecule, a little Mickey Mouse molecule, it could be a solid, like ice, it could be a vapor, or it could be a liquid. So the same two hydrogens stuck onto an oxygen, H2O, dihydrogen oxide, can be a solid, a liquid, or a gas, called phase states. That it floats on its liquid self as a solid, super interesting. There's a whole, I could spend a whole lecture just tripping out about all the neat stuff that water, the molecule of water does that no other molecule does. But can anyone else tell me of another molecule on planet water that occurs in all three phase states, vapor, solid, liquid, that's within the temperature range and pressure ranges naturally found on this planet? Is there another molecule out there that does that? For all you like chemistry, rack your brains, because and you'll come up with there isn't. This is the only one. So it's super special. The interesting thing is, is that water, we can think about it as, in the language of this landscape, if you will, you can think about it as a noun, as a thing, something you can swim in, you could drink, you could ski on, snowboard on, surf on. Um, and, and when we really think about it, the noun of water on planet water is actually finite. The total volume of water that's been on this planet for four billion years is the same amount of water we've had the whole time. It just moves around between solid, liquid, and vapor. So the noun is finite. But because we have this super cool nuke plant up here, I'm completely into nuclear power desalinization. I just want my nuke plant 93 million miles away, turning hydrogen into helium, right? And then desalinating the oceans, leaving the salt there and making these clouds that come down and bring down either solid, liquid, or, or fog in our coastal zone. And that's called the water cycle. And so the cool thing is, is that on an annual basis, the verb of water is infinite because it's a natural resource that's cycling. So the total volume is finite, but the verb is infinite. And this, this is the key game when we get into thinking about resilience and sustainability. So at some level, you can see water as a noun or a verb, but the beauty of it is, is that the water cycle and life cycles are the same cycle. No water, no life. By volume... Every living organism you know on the planet is mostly water. Right? You guys are truly a bunch of bipedal sacs of saline solution. Right? Your blood chemistry and ocean water chemistry are really similar. And so I propose to toast you stay hydrated. I know you all are young and you feel like, oh, you're immortal and such, but you should stay hydrated. Because here's the deal. You're amphibians. And for nine months out of the year, we all, those of you who came out of the womb, actually were amphibious and connected to mama's umbilical cord and then you pop out the water breaks and then basically the older you get the less by volume water you are and death is a function of dehydration check it out every living system this is the game so i'm, I'm going to repeat you should stay hydrated it's super important so we think about water bodies as far as human bodies animal bodies but also we often talk about in the industry water bodies as, as places where water occurs in the landscape, typically known as watersheds. And watersheds are places where there's a ridge line, if you will, and there's headwaters where the water comes down and then it moves through the system and people live in places and do agriculture, urbanization, suburbs, down to the ocean. And these watersheds are these, these containers, these cradles, if you will. Anybody know the watershed we're in here? The big watershed, the basin, you can get me to the sub-trib, you can get me to the local watershed. Right? So the Laguna de Santa Rosa is the bigger one, flows to the Russian River, and what's the creek that's actually on this property? Copeland Creek, right? So that's one of the tributaries 
flowing to a system that eventually connects. So as a biologist, I've I'm interested in thinking about understanding water and understanding geography and then understanding uh, flows through it. And this is a fun book if you got some time in, on one of your breaks called Totem Salmon by a man named Freeman House. And this idea that the first thing we learned from salmon was the importance of the watershed as a unit of perception is a fascinating idea as far as I can tell. Try to think about geography and space having perception. But really the deal is, I think, is that the unit of perception has got to get it is this one. And it's about the headwaters, which is the water in our own head to get the information. So my job today is really to, is basically to mitigate cerebral imperviousness. And I do that through what I call ecosystem restoration, starting in your headwaters. How do we restory the ecosystem, which is what's the story you all collectively, individually, socially, culturally tell you yourselves about this place and where we live? at whatever scale. Is it a community or a commodity? Is it all up for grabs? Is it for sale? Is it, right? Is it the commonwealth? Is it private? How do you perceive that? One of the great thinkers about water is the son of Aldo Leopold, who's one of our great thinkers in America about conservation biology. Read a book called Sand County Almanac. His son, Luna Leopold, one of a number of his children, was a founder of what's called fluvial geomorphology. People who study flow, fluvial, geo, earth, morphology, shape. It's that set of nerds that look at rivers and things and flows and erosion and such. Talk to Jeff Baldwin over there. He knows all about that professor here. And so this idea that the health of our waters is the principal measure of how we live on the land. For me, as, as, a, as a designer, as a practitioner, I'm, I'm looking for feedback with respect to the implication of doing stuff. Is it better or worse? And I guarantee you, that water, the quantity and quality of water in place over time is the principal measure of how well we're doing living on the land. And I'll let you all figure out how comfortable you are uh, getting on your hands and knees and drinking out of any stream anywhere in the Bay Area or California for that matter. Although 100 years ago, everybody did that. So it's not a static deal. So if, it, if, if the health of our waters is the principal measure of how we're living on the land and you believe the thesis that you live on planet water, and the water cycle and life cycle are the same cycle. How do you how do you think we're doing living on planet water? Not good. Right? And so you don't even need to listen to the scientific community to kind of give you a sense of that. I mean, there's lots of indicators out there that <clears throat> I can tell you in 2014, that's that's a big bathing suit. And the game is, is that this idea of global warming is on. And global warming at some level, pretty basically, is just the fact that the planet's running a fever. It's a fossil fuel induced fever, right? Because we've been basically mining a whole bunch of carbon that was put away by life in the Carboniferous era 120 million years ago. And we're pulling it up, coal, oil, gas, actually three phase states, really com complicated molecules. And we're basically burning that stuff and we're exacerbating what's known as the greenhouse effect. The greenhouse effect is just straight physics and chemistry. This is not some made up hyperbolic notion of leftist hippies who hate capitalism is it's, this physics and chemistry. There's our layers. Actually, H2O is the dominant greenhouse gas on planet water for what it's worth. And then there's other greenhouse gases, right? Carbon dioxide, sulfur dioxide, methane, these gases that accumulate in the atmosphere. And some energy from the sun can come in and leave and some stays in here. And we've just thickened the blankie of the atmosphere by accumulating these greenhouse gas emissions, emissions, and it's holding more heat. And so the planet's warming up. I don't think the physics are that darn controversial, actually. I mean, if you're willing to actually believe in fact. Um, it's not that controversial. Um, what is interesting, then, is the fallacy of where's away. And people believe, oh, it goes away. Throw it away. Do I need a visa to go away? Where's away? This idea that the sky's the limit is really what we're running up against. In fact, the sky is the limit. The amount of atmosphere in the sky has a limit to how much CO2 emissions and other greenhouse gases it can accumulate without increasingly overheating the system. And so if you get a greenhouse effect with a thickened blankie in the atmosphere, and basically then we're going to get global warming, and thus climates will change. So those aren't euphemisms. They're actually a sequential relationship of physics and chemistry with biological implication. Greenhouse effect to global warming, climate's changing, right? That's, a, that's a, a flow, a cause and effect relationship. 
And the interesting piece is, if you were to take the entire atmosphere on the planet and compress it to the density of water, the, how thick would that lake be? About 30 feet. So about, if you took all the air and compressed it to the density of water, it would be a 30 foot deep lake. So imagine all the stuff we've been spewing out there over the, in the industrial period is basically like dumping it all into a collective sewer called the atmosphere that could only be 30 feet deep if it was water. Z right? So there's no free lunch on this deal. So when you run in a fever, Anybody had a really gnarly fever? Who's had malaria in the room? You had malaria? It's gnarly, right? I was in the Amazon jungle having malaria. You, four days later, after sweats and chills and sweats and chills, I'd have been happy to die. Straight up, happy to go. So the f interesting piece about that is planets just run in a big fever. And, and I'll come back to when you attempt to break a fever, what does your body do? And the planet is as sensitive as your body. So when you see this kind of stuff from the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, the IPCC, and their most recent big report from 2013, September, a year ago now, about acknowledging that human influence has been detected in the warming of the atmosphere, right? Remember, primarily it's H2O and ocean, and that global changes in global water cycles with reductions in snow and ice and a global mean sea level rise and changes in climatic extremes and we find it extremely likely that human influence has been the dominant cause of the observed warming in the 20th century. What do all these, these equations or these uh, indicators have in common? Across the board, all the dominant indicators on planet water share in common. There are changes in the hydrologic cycle. Because the planet, if it's running a fever like you, the only option it's got to try to break the fever is to convert the phase state of water. So when you sweat, and that sweat, goes to a gas, you, you experience that perspiration as a cooling reaction, right? You all get that one. When you, somebody melts an ice cube on your forehead and that solid goes to liquid, it cools you down. So the loss of snow and ice as it moves from solid to liquid is, a, is basically a big air conditioner at the planetary level trying to slow the fever down. And then we move the liquid to gas, right? So it says global mean sea level rise. It didn't say global nice sea level rise. Because when the sea level comes up in your hood, it ain't going to be nice. And there's great maps for California by the Bay Conservation Development Commission, this California state entity, that have predictions for uh, flooding around the Bay Area. And they've been doing this planetarily, but especially coastal California. And this game is on. And so as far as I can tell, we're going to have a lot of affordable housing in the future. Right? That's housing you have to forward through the water to get to. That's affordable. No. So then there's two ways to die in a desert, right? Is either flooding or, or a thirst. And if anybody's been paying attention, this is the most recent hot off the presses drought monitor. So here's the state of California. And you can see these colors over here and the different levels of it. But see that dark one right there, right? They, what do they call that? It, it's exceptional. That's right. And there's extreme. We have, this is the first time that the entire, in recorded history, the first time the entire state has been within this, all the way from the abnormally through exceptional levels of drought. And it's, it's on. This game is on. If you haven't been paying attention, we're, this, California's in a serious uh, drought. And what's interesting is like, but wait a minute, didn't I just see this past winter, there's this whole thing called the polar vortex, and all of a sudden Atlanta was getting snowstorms this winter, and California's in drought, and the folks who don't believe in climate change via global warming are like, whatever, snowmageddon back east, obviously the planet ain't getting warmer, it must be getting cooler. When you've got a fever, you go through chills and sweats and chills and sweats, and the planet's running that cycle. It's, I guarantee you the planet at 1.4 degrees Fahrenheit, average temperature increase on the planet right now, is as sensitive as your body is if I go from 98.6 to 100 degree temp which is 1.4. It's the, that's what we're experiencing right now. You all are alive and so is this planet we're living on and it's a water-based planet. So the polar vortex, what's interesting is it has to do with what's happening up here and this jet stream, this big old atmospheric river of air and temperature that moves around the Arctic. And when the tropics are hot and the poles are cold, especially the Arctic, the current operating thesis scientifically that's been getting more and more studies that are reinforcing this notion as this melts and warms up, the differential in temperature is decreasing and this river starts slowing down of air. And as rivers slow down, we see this 
in, we could go look in Copeland Creek, I could show you this meander and wiggle, and jet streams wiggle. And so that polar vortex, because there's a high pressure system off of the Pacific, that's like a big rock in the river that's bouncing this jet stream up, pushes it up, and then as water goes on the backside, like a waterfall off the back of the rock, that's what's happening here. So it's about temperature and pressure and such, and the physics, again, aren't that complicated. What do we do about it? The data on loss of pack ice in the Arctic is absolutely clear. Lots and lots of models. These are all different kinds of models. I know you can't read that. That are predicting pack ice loss. And even the, quote, most radical ones don't even measure up to reality, what's measured. Um, so if, you, if you're, if denial is not only a river in Egypt in your world, we might want to rethink that one. And so trip out on what is being really looked at as this jet stream that's beginning to really set up a wiggle because the di temperature differential on the planet is decreasing between the poles and the, and the equator. Really fascinating. So that all may sound like global weirding to you guys, and that's fair enough. It's kind of weird. But I think, and this is my slide attempt to support you in recognizing what's the physics behind this. Which again is <clears throat> when water, the H2O molecule goes, changes its structure from a solid to a liquid or from a liquid to a vapor, as it melts, it actually absorbs energy. And in that absorption, that's a cooling reaction. You, you would experience that ice cube going to liquid. So it, it makes sense then that the planet would melt the solid off of the glaciers and the poles to try to cool the fever, and then it will move the liquid to gas, meaning precipitation, as fast as possible. A swamp cooler. It's a big old air conditioner, basically. And then it goes the other way and such. So I, I, I don't know what to do with it. I don't have any judgment about it, but I find it fascinating as a designer to better understand these physics and these processes if I'm going to respond with resiliency. So I ultimately, in the face of that, I'm looking for a lifeboat. <clears throat> and for me, the, my lifeboat is called a watershed. And from ridgeline to river mouth, from summit to sea, these basins of relations, the Russian River Basin with a little lifeboat called the Santa, Laguna de Santa Rosa to Copeland Creek, these are areas where this hydrologic cycle is playing out. And if the health of our waters is the principal measure of how we live on the land, then let's get landed in a place where we have a relationship to the feedback of the hydrologic cycle. And I think watersheds are the most optimum places geographically for societies to to engage in understanding the implication of their land use over time, your, your settlement in place over time, right? Um, so I got it. I'm, I'm all, all about an Occupy movement. It's about occupying your living lifeboat. So here's the Laguna de Santa Rosa watershed map put out by the Laguna de Santa Rosa Foundation. Main stem Russian River down by Forestville, and you go way up what would be called the South Fork of the Russian, but it's such a special place, the Laguna, because it's so flat. And then you come down here to Katadi and you get into these channelized systems down by Katadi and SSU and Copeland Creek and, and all of that. So within this yellow line is the larger Laguna de Santa Rosa sub-watershed of the Russian River Basin. The Russian River Basin starts way up in Mendocino County. It's between Ukiah and Willits. You go over a grade over there. That's the, the top end of the system. I, I raised some money some years ago with the... Uh, Coastal Conservancy and worked with a local resource conservation district and we put signs all around the county denoting when you're going over ridge lines that are in different watersheds. You could also go to the Oakland Museum and they have these incredible watershed maps for the nine Bay Area counties. If some of you are folks live down in the Bay Area and you'd like to figure out what watershed you live in, it'll have the street grids and everything in there but you still live within a watershed even though it may be a pipe shed all under the asphalt. And I'm not going to argue about whose ass is at fault for that stuff but nonetheless you still live in a watershed, right? So it may be that if you believe that your uh, future is going to be delivered to you in a plastic bottle from some corporation that has privatized somebody else's spring and is delivering you potable water, if that's your perception about, well, whatever, dude, I don't really need to think like a watershed because I got the hook up with the Evian here, then I, I'd argue you might be a tad bit and you're going to have to figure it out. Right? Naivete is, <clears throat> is a choice. And really, I think it's this idea of thinking like a watershed. And we've got to figure out watershed by watershed how to rethink and retrofit for resiliency how it is we do every human land use. Forestry, rangeland, agriculture, rural residential, suburban, urban, 
all of those land uses. Because at some point, even is the, is the case still today, but the quote from Mr. Mark Twain himself back in the 1870s when he looked at California water politics, this idea that whiskey's for drinking and water's for fighting over. And, and that's kind of what we got going on. And there's a whole bunch of water fights going on. And again, I don't know if people are tracking the news or paying attention to the drought, but out in the great central valley, the supposed fruit and nut basket of the planet, um, especially the southern part of the valley, which is known as the San Joaquin Valley versus the Sacramento Valley, right? This lower portion, Sacramento's up here. Um, there's been this incredible rush to drill. And that you can look on this timeline just the last couple of years, the number of wells that are being drilled because surface water, and there's less snowpack in the Sierras and dry winter, so there's less runoff, reservoirs have less water. So folks are drilling down to get water. But this isn't the first time there's been a rush to drill in the San Joaquin. In fact, <clears throat> maybe hard to see that in this light. Back in 1925, the elevation of the valley was up here. And then through the process of developing what is modern agriculture, what's been called the Green Revolution, the entire valley sank 29 and a half feet down to this point where it's 1977. It's called subsidence because the valley was floating on a bed of water. And if you pump all the water out, the whole thing sinks. And so now they're measuring the subsidence is happening again very quickly in the San Joaquin once again. Um, so we live in this crazy dynamic place, and there isn't really in a way, and Ben Franklin had it pretty well figured out, I think, that when the well's dry, you know the worth of water. And I can tell you the number of water trucks that drive out in West County right now delivering potable water because our well, people's wells are dry all over West County, west of Healdsburg, west of Windsor, all around Guerneville and Occidental and Forestville and Canmeager and Freestone, and wells are dry. People are pumping water. People are drilling wells. This reality is on here. Um, some of us work at statewide levels. So I'm part of a California roundtable on food and water supply. And we put out a couple publications which you could find if you go to California roundtable on water and food supply. And this was our most, not the most recent one, the one right before that. We're really looking at how do we rethink storage and understand it more as retention. And, and we're really interested in Seeing storage not as a noun but as a verb, I'm, I'm very much verb oriented, I'm very much process oriented versus the thing. I want flow and time and movement and such. So that's an interesting document. And then our latest one that we just put out this April 2014, this idea of from moving from crisis to connectivity and how do we renew our thinking about managing California's water and food supply. No water, no food is pretty much the deal. So however you're in this world of this class and your ethics and your policy, how you're going to figure those two out around food security, be clear about it. No water, no food. Access to water underlies the availability of food at every place you've ever, you've ever thought about it with respect to food policy councils and such. So we're really interested in, you have to get connected thinking, relational thinking, systems thinking, and then also deal with institutional linkages, bureaucratic connectivity, democracy, and, and also engage the people and private business and public entities and all of that sort of stuff. So have a look at those. A bunch of projects that have been being worked on at community scales, and just to bring us closer back here up to Sonoma County, this is a, an image of the Sonoma watershed, Sonoma Creek. So just kind of over the ridge line here to the east, right, you get Sonoma Mountain and Petaluma's down that way. Over there is the next adjacent watershed. So we're actually probably right somewhere over here off the map. Glen Ellen, town of Sonoma, this drains to San Pablo Bay. And this is a map that was put together by folks working on a, on a groundwater management plan for the Valley of Sonoma and looking at what is recharge potential? What slopes, geology, soils, vegetation are receptive to rainwater if we can slow it down, spread it out, and sink it in the land? And so they've been mapping these areas, green being good, red being poor. If we're going to spend money on trying to get water back in the ground, there are better places to do that than not. And we don't have an unlimited bank account. So at some level, we've been working at these full watershed scale perspectives to develop water budgets. Income, expense, and storage. It's like you got a paycheck coming, you got a piggy bank, and you're writing a check. How do we balance a water budget within a watershed in a cycle like a Mediterranean system with drought where the annual allowance you're being given by the, by the planet, some years it's a good year and some years it's not. You're not working on salary where you just get a paycheck every week. It's a contract job. 
and sometimes you don't work. And many of you may find this when you, as you are working now or go out in your professional lives. Um, so the water cycle is, is a challenging one to figure out. So we have, I, but we think, those of us engaged in this whole systems thinking, that thinking like a watershed and understanding the systems approach has more bang for the buck than isolated uh, approaches. But nonetheless, you as individuals and as families and as society, civilizations and cities, got to figure out, we got to start, we have to choose not to use water. We just got to, we've got to stop using water at every turn. Water conservation. So low flow everything. Uh, hopefully here at Sonoma State there's lots of messages around, you know, don't brush your teeth with the faucet on or all kinds of different ways or low flow toilets or how you wash, you know, your car. You get a $500 fine right now if you're washing your car in California and it doesn't have a turn off switch on the hose. That just went through. So, I mean, there's interesting stuff like that happening. Low flow shower heads. There's a whole... In California, on average, 50 to 60 percent of our water use residentially is used for irrigation, outdoor irrigation, lawns and flower gardens and things like that. So there's a whole uh, Bay Friendly Landscape and Garden Coalition that has a bunch of interesting books out there that deal with water conservation. That also couples with um, basically energy conservation and, and water quality preservation and habitat and all this kind of stuff. So check them out. Some communities are paying cash for grass, which is talking about lawns here, and, and how do you get rid of that lawn that eats up a bunch of water, and one of the ways we do it is we just get cardboard, and you just put cardboard right on the grass. You've probably all maybe left a cardboard box on your parents' lawn for too long. You pick it up, and you're like, oh, the grass turned yellow, and there's worms already. Well, you can do that intentionally. We kill the grass. It's just herbicide by cutting out the light with cardboard, and then we put mulch and things, and there's a whole technique called lasagna gardening. You could put compost and things there and grow garden beds on there and then put in native drought tolerant plants, low water using plants or other things like that instead of your lawn. And so some places are paying anywhere from 50 cents to four dollars a square foot for people to tear out or, or cover over their lawn. Water agencies are paying this down in Los Angeles, four bucks a square foot to get rid of the lawn and put in drought tolerant native landscaping because they can't afford to make new water. There's no new water to make, right? So we got to stop. And then a bunch of us worked on legislation and eventually rewrote the California 16A, uh, Chapter 16A of the Uniform Plumbing Code, for any of you guys going to get into water rights and policy and all that. And we now, you're legally allowed to put in a laundry to landscape gray water system without a permit in California if you follow 10 rules and allow you to basically have a little valve here that switches the water from your laundry out into little basins out in the landscape filled with mulch next to your fruit tree that can allow you when you wash your clothes to be able to irrigate that system and reuse the water. So now I used one gallon for clothes washing and one gallon for irrigation. So I just doubled my water budget by having integrated whole system cycles, right? Because I got now two gallons of function out of the single gallon I used before. So there's lots of creative ways to do that. And then a lot of us work on storm water. When it rains and the water runs over the landscape, it's called storm water as it's getting to the streams and the rivers and the creeks and such. And how do we manage that? And if the old school engineering idea was just what I call pave it, pipe it, pollute it. Just put it in a pipe and make it go away. And then flood the neighbors out downstream, dewater the groundwater from being recharged, and then your well runs dry. So it's like putting, this is like basically taping over the deposit slip on your piggy bank and you're trying to put money in the piggy bank when it's raining but the money's just going away and the piggy bank ain't getting any more but you stick a straw on the side of the piggy bank and you suck it dry all summer, right? You see where that's headed and that is where it is headed. So our, our solution oriented perception is what I call slow it, spread it, sink it. So you either believe you live in the drain age, the age of draining where you're going to have impervious systems and roofs and roads and parking lots and such and you're going to make the water go away, or you live in the retain age, where we retrofit the landscape to receive water, to retain water, to recharge water, and it's a complete rethink on human settlement, where we move our landscapes into receiving flow. And if you're interested in this kind of stuff, these are by far the best two books on the subject. My friend Brad Lancaster out in Tucson, they just got a they just got a monsoon flash flood there yesterday. Unfortunately, my friend's aunt died in the flash flood, drove her car in the in the Vado and took her and swept her away and she just died last night, I just heard, in Tucson. So it's, it's a dry land, average six inches of rain a year, but then all of a sudden they get these crazy big downpours. Brad's home, 100% in the desert, 
all of his water is from what falls on his roof or he harvests from the street. It's an amazing situation. So look at those books. Um, I'm going to scoot past that one there. <clears throat> so we've worked on a number of little guidebooks that you can find and download these on the web if you're interested in them. This slow it, spread it, sink it guide we first did in Santa Cruz County, down south. Then this is the one for the Sonoma Valley Groundwater Management Program. And then I've been up in Canada working in British Columbia in the Okanagan Basin. And, and they have, now have a whole guide. These are really accessible. They're fun. Lots of pictures, little how-to DIY kinds of things. Um, one thing we work with a lot, especially out in West County where we don't have big municipal pipes coming to us for supply, is roof water. So if you just take your roof and measure the length by the width to get a flat plane and end up, you know, multiplying length by width gets you square feet. And then if you basically understand that an inch of rain on, for instance, a thousand square feet, you get 550 gallons of water. So off of this, then you could catch the water off of the, off the gutter or the eaves trough. We don't call them gutters. We don't drink out of the gutter. So eaves trough. And then we might put some little pre-filters there, and then we catch it in the tank, and we can replumb it back in the house. We can set these systems up so your entire water supply for your home could actually be collected off of your roof, which is improving and reducing flood issues in the wintertime and reducing the amount of water you need in the summer. So we do a lot of workshops and trainings. This was a program down in Berkeley in urban areas, so you got to get a bunch of friends to help you get the tank in the backyard. That's a think tank as far as I can tell there. Done a project down in Marin County some years ago with a group called Spawn, Salmon Protection and Watershed Network in the San Geronimo Valley, West Marin. They off the, uh, at a school, an elementary school, they catch water off the roof here and they put in a 30,000 gallon tank, that, this tank, that irrigates this one acre organic vegetable garden that's part of their curriculum and their food supply system, which means they're taking less water out of the creek in the summer, which they used to do, which maintains more water in the stream during the summer for the coho salmon babies to, to breed. So it's all part of coho salmon recovery by re getting a different water supply, funded by the state. We've done a big project in the town of Bodega, not Bodega Bay, but halfway between Occidental and Bodega, and Bodega Bay is a little town called Bodega. And um, this is a project where we've got roof water catchment on the fire hall, 40,000 gallons, got 25 homes with five to 10,000 gallons off their roof. And this is a 240,000 gallon underground tank filled off this dairy barn and I just heard today, I was in a meeting, that this guy no longer uses the well that used to suck from the creek because he has all his water from the roof stored in this underground tank. And so the creek now flows year round, whereas before it would go dry this time of year. And his cows are healthier because the water quality is better from the roof water stored than the nasty water in the creek that the cows were pooping in and was all full of algae. So he's making more money because he's organic certified and his cows are healthier and his vet bills are less and there's more water in stream for the fish and he's reducing flooding and erosion by catching the water off his roof, right? So when you think like a systems perception, we can solve five different problems and save money and make more money simultaneously, right? It's not that complicated if you want to step in and become uh, holistic thinkers, integrated thinkers. When you... At my Water Institute, you can check these out. I have these DIY downloadable PDFs, and this is one of a system we do for roof water harvesting with drain pipe, flexible drain pipe for my chickens and goats there. Um, we've got another one of these guidebooks. You can look at that, where we were catching water off roofs and things and putting it into these, these ditches that we dug, but they're level to the contour, and they slow it, spread it, and sink it. And then we plant trees and things along them. And there are different shapes and things along road ditches. Any way we can figure out how to get more water in the land and stop it from running off in the winter is, we think, is critical. As Josh said, I've been around, my carbon footprint for my jet flights in the last bunch of years is a little bit epic. Um, but I was in Zimbabwe here a couple years ago and teaching these folks there, these farmers, I just found three sticks, the bark that they peeled them for their tomato plants, and I just arranged these three sticks in an A shape, bound them up with bark, and hung a rock on the same piece of bark and taught them how to make a device called an A-frame where we can find dead level contours on the landscape with three sticks, bark, and a rock. Like that, it took me 10 minutes to make that. They just now, two years later, 30 villages are doing this. The women in Shona go to the villages and they sing A-frame songs and teach people how to do rainwater harvesting um, by, by using this A-frame as the, the surveying device to find level on landscape and then you excavate it out. Super interesting. Really fun. 
friend of mine, Betsy Damon here. I was in China and Tibet with her a couple years ago. But this idea that just as water is the foundation of life, it must also be the foundation of design in the built environment. So for those of us who take our cues from that, even green streets in China, you know, really into them? No. Place called Village Homes in Davis. Anybody been to Village Homes in Davis? You should totally go see it. This is one of the greatest little neighborhoods, 240 home development built in the late 70s. And the entire place is patterned where all the buildings face south. They're passive, heated, and cooled with the sun. No, no air conditioning and no external heat in the wintertime. All solar, passive solar. And then all stormwater within the development is captured on site into these spaces between the homes. After their development, they raised the groundwater table 17 feet within the first five years. They didn't sink the whole valley. They actually, not the valley didn't rise up, but the groundwater table underneath there increased. And friends, four years ago, when it was a good year, they harvested seven tons of almonds from the street trees in the median strips between the homes, irrigated solely by rainwater that was running off the roads. Right? So we can have an edible landscape and a potable landscape simultaneously and build these systems that are more pleasurable to live in and regenerative. So our design mantra is regenerative hedonism. Think about it. This is Seattle. They took the street that was wide and failing and they put wiggles in it and these storm gardens and rain gardens and sidewalks and better parking and retrofitted the street called Street Edge Alternatives. So it now catches water, infiltrates water. They have native uh, landscapes along the side there, wildlife habitat. They've reduced flooding. They've improved water quality, improving their ability to recover salmon and get the federal government off their back for impacting salmon with polluted storm water. And the homes on either side of these areas that have been retrofitted are appraising at 10% more on the real estate market than the homes that have it because it's a nicer place to live. Right? Los Angeles, super into this. Go to the Sun Valley Watershed Project up in San Fernando Valley. And they folks there wanted new ball fields and they wanted to improve their existing ball fields and they wanted trees and daylighted creeks. And so they basically pulled up the ball fields. They put these huge chambers underneath the ball fields that are bottomless. They're on gravel. And then they divert all the storm water that would run off the parking lots and the roads and the roofs and everything underneath the ball fields. They fill up in these chambers and they go back into the groundwater. So now they're again reducing flooding, improving water quality, recharging groundwater for local supply. So when Lake Mead in the Colorado River, which is going to be dry in about five or six years at this point, be clear about it, Hoover Dam's about done. Vegas is drilling a hole right now to try to tap the bottom of it because they're about to suck air. LA's, they're getting their water from the Colorado, from the east side of the Sierra, snowpack's gone, San Gabriel's gone, Central Valley. So this is local on-site water supply. And the estimate is that if you retrofitted the San Gabriel watershed, the LA basin, with these type of techniques, they could live with their current water demand by 50%. Right? They could catch and store and contain and reuse 50% of the total demand within the system by retrofitting it and have cleaner water, daylighted creeks, better ball fields that are playable longer, and a Los Angeles River that's not totally polluted. And save 400 million bucks over the next 20 years. And in this case, the project only costs 40 million bucks up front, and they're saving 400 million over the next 20 years for that one project. The money's here. If, if economics is what you think is the driver, this is blue gold. These are li this liquid assets in your bank account. They're now tearing streets up all over LA and putting groundwater recharging chambers under the streets. They get this. This is where the money's at. Little small rain gardens. San Francisco. <clears throat> I don't know if you have a sense of San Francisco. The, if you look at the peninsula and you were to chop a cross section looking north, say if you're Palo Alto looking north, so Ocean Beach and everything's out here to the west and bay views on the east side there. This is from the San Francisco Public Utility Commission. And they said the pre-development condition of the peninsula was like lakes and dunes and rivers and things and wetlands and all that. And then they depleted, polluted in the groundwater of the current condition. And now they're going for a low impact design system where they're basically going to take this development model and make it function like this. So they want the noun to perform like that verb. And this is the guidance design for the retrofit of all of San Francisco right now. Or you could go to the Chungi Chung River in Seoul, Korea. See how pretty it was? Oh, it was a freeway a couple years before that image. Communities all over the world are doing this. Here's a project, a six acre water garden that takes polluted water from here and runs it through a series of living water flow systems and they, then the children get to play in this water that you wouldn't even get near it in the river, but through biology and, 
and, and gravel and plants and bacteria, we can clean this stuff up. You could clean it so much up that you could retrofit your pool in your parents' backyard and put a living liver in it with edible things like cattails and taro root and wasabi, stock it with freshwater lobsters, and you could swim, bathing suit optional, in your backyard pool, chlorine free, swim down, grab up a freshwater lobster, crack that thing open, grind some wasabi poolside, filled it off the roof, sheet mulch the lawn, have an edible food forest, with water in the well and food in the land, what need for king or government to have eyes, the ancient Chinese saying. We're talking about security here, right? And so just a couple thoughts here. I do want to chew a little bit on my favorite furry friend, which is the beaver, because they're the smartest engineers out there. They're the lumbermen, architects, and engineers, these beavers, these aquatic engineers. And the fun part is, is not all dams or dam makers are created equally. And a beaver dam is not the Hoover Dam. It's a different thing. Beaver dams are designed in such a way that they, they provide all this complexity, all this habitat and recharge and fish passage and cold water and slow water for juveniles and such. And a, a Haida saying, the Haida people in the Pacific Northwest, native people there, basically say that beaver taught salmon how to jump and such. And so we work with a bunch of folks in the West and there's a lot looking at beaver as climate adaptation tools for watersheds. If we're going to have less snowpack and more liquid and we have beavers in the high mountain meadows, can we hold more water in those wetlands and release it slow versus it running off if we've got less snow? And um, our good friend Glennis Hood basically says we're suffering from beaver deficit disorder. And they've done a whole bunch of study looking at 60% more open water in areas where they've got beaver versus not having beaver. So Beaver has water supply, folks. And that may mean that, you know, we're going to have to airlift some beavers out there, like in the 1950s in Arizona. Or actually in, in 1948 in Idaho, they parachuted beavers into the wilderness. In California, in the, in the 50s, we were parachuting beavers out into the wilderness to, because we understood their benefit. So I have a couple papers that, with a group of us, uh, um, we've published re-looking at the historical ecology of beaver um, distribution in the state of California. And we now have a, beaver, a new beaver map. It used to be thought that beaver were only in the hatched areas, Colorado, Central Valley, and Klamath. But now we have evidence, we think, that asserts that beaver were much more widely distributed. So we want a new flag, and this is like California Republic, the beaver state. And I guess in sum, the question is, is are you part of the solution or part of the precipitate? And so step up to the mic. Speak truth to power. If that's a fish suit at the Port of Soups, then so be it. And then I'm interested in you getting this conservation hydrology. How do you adapt our water footprint? It's regenerative, rehydrative, receive, recharge, retain, release, and a resilient retrofit of human settlement for both human health and watershed integrity over time in the face of global weirding. And so with that, I thank you, and there you have it. So it's an it depends answer. I mean the tank itself, depending on the material, roughly you end up averaging that it's a buck a gallon stored. So a ten thousand gallon tank is gonna cost you ten grand. For the grading, the plumbing, the fitting of it, the siting of it, the purchase of the tank, all of what it's going to take to have it installed, somewhere in that range is what it's going to end up costing you. All right, thanks. Uh, let's say one more uh, thank you to Brock.